Hi, everybody. For real? It's, come on, yeah. it's the first day. Yeah. That's better. You look That's shocked. Better. <laughs> How was lunch? We had good lunch, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Cupcakes? Good? All right. No cupcakes for me. We'll talk about your issues later. I know, it's true. <laughs> So first of all, welcome everyone. The session, as you can see, is, uh, or we talked about, is large-scale deployments and how the Casper Suite can help you in those deployments. My name is Priya David, and I'm a professional services manager here at Jamf Software. And before I joined Jamf, um, I, I actually used to work at another provider where we would do professional services for them, or actually for you all. And then prior to that, I was a systems engineer with Apple Education. We'll turn it over to Matt Perfect. real quick. Uh, I'm Matt Bentley, that guy. Had more hair then. Um, so I'm a professional services engineer. I report into uh, to Priya. Uh, before I was at Jamf, I started at Jamf about a year ago. Um, prior to Jamf, I worked for a large financial services company. And prior to that, an apparel company and a small graphic design company. So sort of the, the ramp up and then the eventual jump over to, uh, to Jamf. Uh, that's me. So. When we're plan sorry, let's go through the presentation agenda real quick. There are four key areas that we want to talk to you about today. Planning, developing the solution, imaging and deploying, and then sustainability. By a show of hands, how many folks are um, doing a large-scale deployment or planning for one at this time? OK. Is this your first type of deployment for a lot of folks? And just out of curiosity, how many of those are OS X deployments? And how many are iOS deployments? Okay. Pretty evenly split. Cool. Great. Excellent. And then um, just one more thing. We'll be taking questions and answers at the end of our session. So if a question comes up, please go ahead and jot it down. Maybe it'll get addressed during the session, or we can, we can talk about it towards the end. So to begin, there we go. Before we get started, we really want you to think about what does success look like in your, in your area? What does success look like in your environment? For some, this is what success looks like, right? We think it's a straight shot up, but it's not. There are a lot of complicated components to it. But success can be, we want to roll out 4,000 devices to our end users. Success can be, we're getting a number of machines into our environment. We actually have to get one out to each one. That's what we're seeing in enterprise more often, whereas education is, is a larger component. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we definitely are seeing sort of those, those two extremes, right? We see uh, uh, 4,000 machines by the end of next week, or we see 4,000 machines through the course of the year, 5, 10, 15, 20 at a time. And, and so kind of what we hope to do today is maybe talk a little bit around some of the differences there, some of the similarities, um, the tools, the, the planning that needs to go into it. Um, I think for a lot of us, uh, the, the, the more IT savvy among us, there's that tendency to oversimplify and yeah. to overpromise. 4,000 machines in a week, no problem. And Has anybody actually done that? <laughs> OK, just checking. We have. Um, so yeah, it, you know, it, it, there, there are all these things that, uh, that you know, you, you might not recognize until the day of. Um, and so what we hope to do is save you some of that trouble, right? Save you some of the heartache, some of the stress. Um, so hopefully you can let us know if we've pulled that off by the end of the presentation. What we have next for you is a quick snapshot, quick video for you of a customer that we got to work with this summer who they were deploying about 4,000 devices in their environment. They were not new to the Mac platform, but this was the first time they were doing a large deployment like this. So they asked us to come and assist with them uh, with that whole project. And we did everything from the planning through the imaging through the deployment. So we're just going to take a quick look at this video, and then we're going to go ahead and deconstruct what we actually did with this customer.
that was success in their environment right there. <laughs> So when we talk about planning and the who's who, we, we took a look at the entire project team. And there are a lot of folks who are involved. It's not just IT. It's not just instru instructional technology to, to talk about education. Um, it's really so far across the board that we actually had to work with their facilities team to figure out where we're going to warehouse the equipment. Would the equipment be as secure? Um, so the project team was really expansive. So you want to make sure that when you're planning and in this phase, you're looking at all of the key players, included, including your vendors. You want to let your vendors know if, I don't know, maybe there's a network upgrade happening that might impact the project. Um, not that that would ever happen. No. No. <laughs> and then talking about timelines, right? When you're determining your rollout date, that's really your end date. In, I'm a project manager by trade. So I have my end date, and then there's my goal date, which is usually well before my end date. One of the things that we want to make sure is we're giving ourselves enough time so that if anything happens, and we all know that that success, that success graph is exactly what it is, right? Success is all over the place. We want to make sure that we have ample time to fix any issues that come up. Any OK. Physical location, talked about that. You want to make sure that your location is ample, um, that it's secure, because you're going to have potentially million dollars worth of equipment available to you. And while the, I, I, I'm sure this would never happen in your environments, um, we've, we actually have heard of laptops walking away, which is quite remarkable in, in and of itself. Your imaging space, you want to make sure that you have plenty of networking, electrical, all of these components available to you in your imaging space. And then another key question, who's hauling the trash? Right? You're getting cardboard boxes. You're getting a lot of the plastic and all the wrapping that comes with your, your devices, be they iOS or OS 10. Who's actually going to be hauling that away? And is there a recycling opportunity as well? And that's definitely one of those sort of non-IT things, right? Like, oh. Yeah, a bunch of iPads does produce a bunch of trash. I wonder what we should do with all that. Do we have to recycle? Is there like a countywide mandate that I have to do a thing like that? And that is definitely not the kind of thing that you like to figure out while you've got maybe a team of five or six helpers who are all just waiting on you to say, do a thing. And you're not quite sure now what that thing is supposed to look like. Um, where are you going to put that trash? Uh, when is that trash going to get picked up? Is it an eyesore for the, for the enterprise, for that district, whatever it might be? So again, this is just to start to touch on those handful of non-IT issues that are absolutely IT issues because, well, you're the ones rolling out the, the machines. We talked about securing the equipment. So the, the project that we we're talking about that's in the video, they had a huge warehouse where all of the equipment was stashed. Stashed, that's probably not the right word. <laughs> that's, what we're go with. that's what we're going to go with right now. Um, and it, as part of this warehouse, they actually had another room, which I'm going to show you in a moment, sorry. Um, the imaging room was right off of the warehouse, so it allowed for a really good workflow when we're taking the equipment out, imaging it, asset tagging and all of that, and then putting it back after it was reboxed. Having that space was really advantageous to us because it allowed for a really smooth workflow, but that's not every environment, right? I mean, sometimes you're hauling boxes from, uh, from one location to another where you're going to do the imaging, and then you're going to put it somewhere else. So be mindful when you're, when you're going through this whole process of what is the best workflow from a physical standpoint as well. It's not just the technology. And keep in mind, too, um, you know, we talk about vendors, and I think when we talk about vendors, all of us have a tendency to picture uh, maybe whether it's Apple or some sort of a fulfillment company uh, to, for purchasing our gear. But when you are working in certain environments, you know, one of your vendors could be the, the union. If there's uh, someone who is responsible for, they manage the warehouse. I can go over and pick up 100 boxes and move them from here to there, but I may not be allowed to do that. So again, it starts to come out to these sorts of things where we can all roll our eyes or feel as though we're doing the right thing one way or the other, wherever you fall on that scale. But the rules are the rules. And this is another thing where there's no reason for you to be shocked by that when the day comes. Why not just have thought about it a little bit ahead of time, find out who it is you need to reach out to, and talk to those folks. Um, more often than not, you find that they're a little bit surprised that someone didn't come to them to the day of. 
and then say, we need you to help with this, that, and the other. Instead, you're bringing them in early on and saying, we're planning to do this. Are there any things locally that we should know about? Um, regulations, rules, things like that. Um, and a lot of times, it, it goes a long way. You know, they, uh, folks don't feel as though they're just being brought in at the last minute and, and saying, pick it up and put it down, you know, that sort of a thing. Has anyone been in this kind of situation before where you found out last minute that you had to, you're responsible for something by a show of hands? Anybody? No. Yeah. We all know what that feels like. It stinks. <laughs> so don't be that person, right? Especially when you're, I mean, really, the end goal is to get these units out. So the more you can be doing to, to prepare and to plan, the better off you're going to be. This is another component. The electrical piece of it, it's not only for when you're imaging devices, but also for the end user. And this, I think, really touches on education more um, than the corporate environment. But in a one-to-one -one program, do your schools have enough electrical outlets or um, charging stations for the laptops, for example, to make sure that the kids are able to use their equipment throughout the day? Um, these are considerations that sometimes it's an afterthought. Sometimes it's a, oh, we should have been thinking about that, and now we need to, to figure out another solution for it. So it's, an, it's another key point that you want to be thinking about. This was the imaging room uh, where we worked. It was, um, what we did is actually brought in another table that had two shelves, which allowed us to do a lot more as far as setting up the equipment and setting up the master machines. Just, Just out of curiosity, uh, how many folks have been to Louisiana? Anybody? All right. <laughs> in August. What's the one thing you see in that room that might be just a pinch lacking for Louisiana in August? Yeah, that is a, that, that air conditioner is pequeño. It's a little bit on the small side. Um, yes. And so again, coming back to this idea of, well, that's a soft, fluffy thing that I don't have to worry about. You're going to be worried about it when it's like 100 degrees in there and you're in there for eight hours. You know, these sort of soft concerns. They're things that you can totally plan for, and it will make the whole group that you're working with a heck of a lot happier. Um, much nicer to not just sort of be dripping all over a student's brand new MacBook Air or something like that if there's no need to. Um, well, and also from the, for the safety of the equipment, right? You don't want to be in a situation where you're storing equipment at 110 degrees. It may not be the best thing for electrical components. I don't know. You guys might want to test it out, but I would, I would strongly discourage that. <laughs> Maybe with two iPads, not 4,000 iPads. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Do you want to talk through network? Sure. So, you know, we, we sort of mentioned this and we all go, oh, we'd never do that. And the thing is, is we might, but the other folks that you work with might also be trying to meet a deadline. And so this is another reason that it's a great idea to reach out to the networking team, directory services folks. Maybe they've planned a, you know, a switch from Nobel to Active Directory. Uh, in this day and age, I don't know that that's super likely, but maybe. Right? And so you're going through and looking at these various places, and those are potential points where it's going to make or break your project. Um, we have seen in certain environments where all of a sudden, because every machine was tied into a, maybe just a single DHCP server, we ran out of addresses. Now, that's a, well, that would never happen. Well, it does happen. You know, so you, know, you always hear the uh, uh, proper pre-flight pre planning prevents poor performance. So anyway, that sort of thing here, there's no shortage of uh, things that are going to come up that you couldn't account for. These things you can account for. So talking with those network teams ahead of time, talking with the directory services folks, just trying to prevent that big surprise. Again, when you've got five, six, 10 people all sort of staring at you, looking for you to have the answer on how to fix things. And then just a couple more things about networking. You can continue. Sure. <laughs> so, I'll give you the floor. Right. I appreciate it. Start dancing. Um, so Wi-Fi coverage and density, I mean, you've all been to conferences, yes? You've all used our Wi-Fi here today. There's, a, there's just a physical limit, radio waves and people, right? Uh, so you want to try and avoid those sorts of things if you can, uh, if that means just temporarily beefing things up with additional base stations, if that means trying to spread out. Um, the operation as you're doing it so that you're not saturating a single access point, but maybe spreading it out across a few. And then when it comes to your wired networks, um, folks that use NetBoot, hands, anybody? Yay, the unicorn lives. Um, so folks that have used NetBoot on 10 base T, <laughs> yeah, how awesome was it? Show of hands, who thought that was awesome? Nobody. That's right. So, you know, you start looking at things like that. Well, gee, you know, we were planning on using NetBoot, and all we have here is this, you know, ancient switch 
uh, that's, that's not really giving us the oomph that we'd like. So that comes back again to the infrastructure upgrades, which starts to talk to, well, gee, if you were planning an infrastructure upgrade, it would be cool if you did the warehouse first this summer. Because why not, right? They're going to get to the warehouse eventually. Why not do the warehouse first? And now your deployment goes faster. So again, uh, I guess I am that broken record. Little things are going to come up. But account for the ones that you can account for. These sorts of infrastructure-related issues, it's not like they cropped up overnight. And they're not going to go away overnight either. But certainly, you could try and highlight a reason um, for why folks might want to take and go ahead and upgrade switches or upgrade APs. And one thing I'll add to the wireless component of it, how many folks here just have one device that connects wirelessly? Yeah. Two devices? Three devices? I mean, that's the world in which we live, right? So you really want to be thinking about, does our wireless network and does the infrastructure really um, give us the ro robust endpoint that we want? Um, are our users saying, you know what, I can't get anywhere, and Google is taking 10 seconds to load, because heaven forbid it should take 10 seconds. Um, but really, want to consider that we're, we're no longer a one-to-one -one nation, right? We're, we're multi-device to one person. So th that's another thing to just keep in mind as you're planning out your wireless infrastructure. Good. So developing the solution, um, yours, mine, and ours, right? Who owns the device? And this is both, we're finding this both in corporations as well as in education. Who is the end user? Not only the end user, but who is the end owner of that device? Um, we, we're seeing a lot more bring your own device models in both marketplaces. So thinking about your policies and such as you're, as you're planning. Acceptable use policies, that goes for both education as well as enterprise. If you're going to be on my network, here, here are the things that we're going to allow you to do. Are there folks out there that actually do have their end user sign acceptable use? Maybe let's say in the enterprise space? <clears throat> awesome. I owe all of you a hug. How about in the education <laughs> space? I would guess maybe a little more prevalent. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things that I, maybe I just have a personal frustration with. You don't get to get mad at people for doing something you never told them not to. I mean, yeah, common sense should prevail. But why not just state it out there and get a signature on it? Um, sure, folks are still going to make mistakes and do silly things. But at the very least, everybody kind of knows what the rules of the road are. And that actually can be a great way for you setting the bar for what kind of service you're going to deliver. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all there to provide some sort of a service to our users. Yes, it's about when things break, we fix them. But you should also be trying to provide a service out to folks. And so that could mean that you let them know when a new version of Firefox comes out, because it's been three and a half minutes, that <laughs> we will have that new version of Firefox available for you in self-service. Uh, within five business days, five school days, whatever it might be. Everybody kind of knows then what to expect so that no one goes, oh, it's been two and a half hours and they still don't have Firefox up there yet. I don't know what they do all day. Well, you know, if you tell them, yeah. we'll have it up within X amount of time. And that helps set that expectation. So I think a lot of times we all think of acceptable use is about what you can and can't do. But it can also be about what you can expect from your IT staff. Um, and I would love to take full credit for that, but that was from Mac IT, like the guys from AFP 548 a few years ago were real strong with that, and it's stuck with me ever since. Um, why not do it? You know, it's one piece of paper, it'll take a half hour to write it. And then one more qu quick question out of a show of hands how many folks allow their end users to be admins on the machines? Mm. Okay, quite a few of you. Did I just hear, did I hear a r low grumbling? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the noise that I just heard? It's like the handbrake, rubble, 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 rubble. Honestly, while you guys are here over the, the next couple of days for the conference, talk to one another. For the folks who are not doing that, find out what, what's been successful and what hasn't been successful. I think that could lead for some really interesting conversation, or hopefully no arguments. But you know, I'll leave that up to you. Um, but really, what, for us, it's about empowering our end user. You know, what kind of experience do we want them to have? It's not just about locking down a machine anymore. So. Absolutely. And just with that last point, will the devices remain on site? I know Andrina Kelly had a great presentation about what to do when a device sort of uh, doesn't remain on site and then goes to some other site that you have nothing to do with. Um, you know, there are some neat tools out there that can help in those sorts of situations. But again, that has infrastructure implications for you. 
right? So regardless of if you want to get into the whole uh, tracking of devices and, and things like that, um, there's an awful lot where you could sort of think through, gee, uh, if we're trying to manage this device and I can only really manage the device when it's on network, what does that mean for us from an infrastructure perspective? Does that mean that we want to look into doing management off network? Does that mean we want to beef up our VPN endpoint? Again, coming back to that broken record of infrastructure. Um, you bring in 4,000 new machines, and everybody gets VPN access. Has anybody talked to the VPN folks yet? Do they know that that deluge of new customers are coming their way? Maybe not. So again, you can sort of read into all of this stuff. Uh, you know, if it were a Venn diagram, I guess. You know, there's a lot that she's had to tolerate so much Venn diagram talk in the last couple it's weeks. It's true. Um, <laughs> no, but if if it were that diagram, you know, you're going to see overlapping parts where it's almost always going to involve infrastructure folks, IT folks, management folks, and then you know, hopefully the one big circle is the user, right? That they will somehow benefit from all of the hard work that you've put in place. Hmm. How many people are just supporting 10.8? Yeah. Awesome. How about 10.8 and 10.7? 10.8, 10.7, 10.6. and 5? Wow. Oh, man. Ten, I'm just for the sake of it. 10.4? Wow. That's awesome. 10.3. I'm going to keep going until it stops. Wow. I think we ten wow. two. I owe him. I owe him a beer. Not official. That's fantastic. So we'd all love to think it's just about the latest and greatest. Obviously, it's not. Um, you know, as as you go through with your day to day, there are going to be all sorts of new technologies that you can take advantage of uh, within any number of management tools, especially ours. But you have to keep in mind, you might not just be supporting that latest and greatest. And so as you go through planning for OS versions, planning for your uh, deployable software, you know, there might be software that still maybe is making use of Rosetta. And so what do you do now when the, uh, uh, the head of the company or something walks in with a brand new MacBook Air and there is no Rosetta? Um, so those sorts of considerations, they definitely start to pop up. Um, and you know, it, again, comes back to that acceptable use document, or maybe even just some sort of a, a district or an enterprise policy of, we will support back X number of versions. Now, there's a lot of times there's budgetary concerns. Well, that's all well and good, but it, it, we have a budgetary requirement. We can't necessarily just lop off, you know, thousands of dollars worth of equipment. So, please. Absolutely. Yep. This test will work on this. Exactly right. And, and just for folks who didn't hear, uh, the you know maybe specific requirements for uh, curriculum and testing, um, so that it will only work on a particular type of gear or maybe just a particular machine. Period. Um, so those things again, trying to get back into that idea of planning, and a lot of times I think it doesn't hurt to go through and maybe just have yourself a list. And anytime a casual conversation comes up, you add it to the list. Now you've got something to start with when you start to try and plan a whole project. The other thing to keep in mind is not only the backwards compatibility, but when Apple releases a new operating system, the cutover is immediate. So you might have 10.8, but when Mavericks releases, all of a sudden you'll have 10.9 in your environment. What does that do for you? What does that do to your environment? What does that do to your support structure? Does it, um, are there any applications that are going to have challenges working on the new operating system? Those, those are things that you need to start considering. So it's not only about backwards compatibility, but also looking forward. Um, because there are limited options as far as that goes. That's true. <laughs> Same thing goes for the applications in your environment. So it's not just the operating system. What applications will you be deploying? Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Let's try this again, shall we? You know what? I'm just going to leave it be. So what applications are you deploying? But not only what applications, but what versions of applications. Um, we've worked with with customers who They'll have a version of Firefox, but they'll also have a couple of other versions of Firefox, same type of customizations. Um, there, are, there are users who have different requirements. So you want to be thinking about what does that really look like, and are there any policies that you need to put in place that says, you know what, here are the two versions we'll, we'll support. We won't be supporting four different versions of Firefox, because that could be a full-time job right there. It's true. Um, but as you're planning out your, your applications, it's not only about the, the software title, but the versioning, the customizations, the compatibility with the operating system. 
So when you start to think about getting those applications, it used to be the physical media, that was, that was what you cared about, right? Everybody had that big black file cabinet that locked, that had the little three ring trapper keeper that had all of the media. That was only right? you, Matt. Berenstein <laughs> Bears, you know? Um, so that's not the case anymore. I mean, uh, uh, you know, you look at folks with MacBook Airs or Retina uh, MacBooks as well, they don't even have an optical drive, right? And so, Yes, those pieces of physical media are still important, but more and more now uh, downloads, whether those downloads are from the web or they're coming from the App Store, or in the case of iOS apps, if you're looking to mass deploy, then we're also talking about getting stuff out of iTunes as well. So it's just, again, one of those places where, gee, I, I'd never thought of that. I you know, still use CS3 or something along those lines, and the disk was all I needed. And as you start to move forward, um, all of a sudden, more and more, you find that you're downloading, and now your file shares become important. Again, that comes back to infrastructure. Do you have space to store all of this stuff? So again, just trying to plan that stuff out. Make sure that you've got the, uh, the overhead or, or the available wiggle room to store all of that new, uh, new media. And then also just a quick touch on Apple IDs and the volume purchase program. While it's available to both education as well as business, it adds a, a, an extra layer of mm, thoughtfulness, we'll say, yeah. complexity. Um, as far as managing the, the IDs, how do you want to do that? Who, who owns that ID? It becomes a deeper conversation than just, hey, I have a CD, I can pop it in. Yep. And especially with Apple IDs, too, you start to uh, maybe uh, that opens up conversations for things along the lines of ownership, as Priya had mentioned. And, and what we really mean by that is that institutional ownership, that when the student or the employee leaves the organization, does the organization still technically own the app, or did we now gift it to them? Uh, via VPP or something along those lines. And so that, again, it starts to open up these conversations, those interdepartmental conversations, something that was just an IT conversation before, uh, maybe just a purchasing conversation. We need a volume license for 300 seats of this particular app. Now is also maybe a conversation about budgeting. Uh, maybe it's a conversation that has a little bit more of a far-reaching implication. Are you setting policy without really realizing it? People point to you and go, but they did it. Um, so. Again, just trying to have those conversations ahead of time. So you definitely start to find, um, as you go through that hardware, what's the one thing the MacBook Air doesn't have that those other two models do have? Matt's going to buy a beer for the person who answers it. Uh, was it you? <laughs> who is it that said it? Yeah, absolutely, Ethernet. And so here we sit with a bunch of MacBook Airs that we need to image, and we'd like to image them quickly and have them all check into uh, their management server. And that's why we needed a pile of those, right? Yep. Now, you know, those also made a number of things possible for us. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's not a heck of a lot different than I guess maybe just thinking that it's a very expensive Ethernet cable. But, um, but. You know, these are the types of things that uh, if you're there the day of getting ready to image and have all those devices check in, and maybe you're using authenticated Wi-Fi, well, you're not going to walk around to every machine, log in as that particular end user, and then try and authenticate it. You'd like to have something can just get on the wire right now. And so uh, again, not the type of thing you want to be surprised on, uh, about on the day of. So when we were um, working with this particular customer, we had a couple of options with them. They had a really robust network, so we could have done NetBoot. But for the time frame that we had and what they wanted to accomplish with the size of their image and all of that, we actually used target mode imaging. Have folks been using that? Yeah. Awesome. OK. The folks who have been using NetBoot, if you want to talk. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. You know, one of the things that comes up a lot of times here, um, we'll go out and we'll work with folks. and. Uh, They've already done this stuff, right? You guys have done this stuff. Um, and so it becomes less a conversation about how do we do it and more a conversation about how do we do it well. Yeah. And so you start to talk about things like, well, you do have the bandwidth for NetBoot, but have you considered target mode imaging? Well, I didn't really think that was for us. And you know, it's fast, but how much faster is it really? Uh, and then you start to get into things like, well, what about caching all of the packages locally on an admin box? And now we're not pulling things over the network. And now that means that we don't have to do it after 5 o'clock because we bring the network to its knees when you know, 40 machines all pull over you know, 10 gigs worth of packages or something like that. Instead, we could just take and put all that stuff on a local repository on the admin machine that's imaging our target machine. 
So you start to come up with little things like that that just give you a leg up. Now, that's not a dig against Netboot. Matter of fact, you could do the same thing with Netboot. But um, it does start to show that even if you've used some of these things before, there are always like little ways to tweak, little ways to improve, little ways to speed it up. How many folks have one monolithic image that they deploy currently? OK. Cool. So, so are most folks using a sort of, kind of? OK. Sure. So as we go through this, um, I guess monolithic versus modular, for those who maybe have or haven't heard the terms before, but just to give a quick refresher either way. Uh, you go to the supermarket, you get the prepackaged deli sandwich, it's wrapped up and it has mustard on it. You don't like mustard, tough cookies, you're getting a sandwich with mustard, right? Monolithic image. Shrink wrapped, you built the perfect box, you created an image from it, you'll restore that image onto your client machines and then maybe enroll them some other way down the line, right? Monolithic imaging has a lot of pros. Uh, it's fast because you can get a block level copy. Um, if you don't have to make a ton of changes, then it's pretty maintenance free. If you're gonna do most of your changes once the machine is enrolled, great, go right ahead, you know? On the other side, if you do have a lot of change within your environment, whether it's the requirement that every box ship with the latest patch version of Firefox or whatever it might be, then modular imaging gets to be pretty nice. You're starting with just that base uh, OS and then layering in the packages that you might need as you go. Then you can just wrap those up as a playlist or a configuration, right? So it's a great way to be flexible, not having to necessarily every time go back to that box that's now been sealed in lead, take it out, make some changes to it, create a new image, and then put it back into the box that's sealed with lead so no one messes with it. Um, the one thing that comes up, though, is that if you're using modular imaging, the one thing that you've never really done then is potentially actually use the machine after you've added everything in the kitchen sink to it, right? So monolithic image, you actually had to build the machine, configure it the way you want, and then maybe test it, use it, make sure that it worked okay, and then get your image from it. Well, if you're doing modular and you started with a base, you know the base worked, but then you add in all these packages. Have you tested those? Maybe you haven't. So this really is more of a sort of a, a, a repetitive process of creating packages as need be, new version of Firefox, great, now I've got a package, building that into your image, and then testing it, and then going back and adding another piece and another piece and another piece. What you see a lot of times, and I just wanna save you all the trouble, is here's all my packages, let's throw them in, and gee, a bunch of stuff doesn't work yet, huh. And now you've gotta sort of try and figure out, well, is it a conflict between various things that cause that to not work? On the other hand, if you were to just be super deliberate about it, it feels like it takes more time, but you know what? When you come across something that doesn't work, you know it right then, you focus on that one thing, you figure it out, and you move on. So it feels slower up front, but really total time, you actually end up saving quite a bit of time. And I'm gonna add just a little bit to that. I'm sure you guys already know this, but it makes me feel better to say it. The person who builds the image should not be the person who tests the image, <coughs> right? It should be your end user, it should be somebody who, who's not, who may be familiar with the process or familiar with what the outcome should be, but if you're the one building the image, you should not be the one testing it because you're just gonna, you'll know things and how things should be, but if you get someone who's unfamiliar or it's new to them, you'll have a better experience because they'll be able to pinpoint saying, hey, you know what, these components didn't work, so a um, couple of recommendations, maybe chalk out a QA plan that says, Here are the thing, here's the expected behavior, and then, equip that person with, with that unit and then provide a feedback loop so you know how to fix the things that are broken. Absolutely. And then same with iOS considerations. Do you want to talk about that? Sure, sure. As you go in and you look at uh, all the tools that are available, um, I think you know, one of the things that, uh, that has maybe been a little bit more recently on everybody's mind is just that idea of how do I make sure that certain things stay the way I set them. And that opens up for a great conversation about MDM plus. And the plus in this case is plus configurator. Um, one of the most beautiful settings inside configurator is just that ability to say this stays no matter what. This config profile that I'm laying down stays no matter what. Student, faculty, whoever, they don't get to remove it, right? And so um, 
that's a great place for you to take and use your MDM solution, whatever it might be, in addition to something like Configurator. Uh, the two of those together give you that flexibility to change the things over the air that you might like to, but make sure that certain things stay set the way you'd like. Just uh, additionally, uh, I think we had some other stuff up there just about some of the changes in yeah. uh, Casper 9. Um, there have been a handful of changes. If any of you guys have been trying to, uh, to enroll devices, maybe uh, do a mass enrollment of devices, and have had a little bit of trouble, please come up and see us afterwards. We're happy to show you the one or two extra steps um, that, uh, that will help you out on that. Casper imaging. Oh. So we thought it would be useful just to give folks a peek um, at what we saw as maybe just sort of a general deployment, what that deployment might look like. Um, so if you take a look at the next slide, actually, um, we've just got an idea for you of what a base student image might look like. Um, and just on the side there, of course, you can see faculty image and lab image. Now, this is specific to us, right? You may be using other tools, but the large uh, sort of broad strokes of this, they remain the same no matter what tools you're really using. Um, all the stuff that we've talked about should have hopefully gotten you to this place where you feel confident in your network, you feel confident in your packages, and now it's really just a matter of putting those pieces together. Um, if you take a look through, we've essentially got maybe just say a base image and then a number of packages uh, that we've gone through and categorized. Now, our whole idea here is that we've got this idea of configurations. If you want to think of them as playlists, that's fine. Um, first do this, then this, 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 this. And when you're done, reboot, and off we go. That machine should already be enrolled, checking into your server. Um, one of the things that this does give us an opportunity to talk about, though, is that a lot of organizations, especially more on the enterprise side, uh, they might never see us as an IT team. You know? uh, end user is empowered. They can go out to the purchasing website, and poof, a laptop shows up on their desk. And so this workflow, though great for deploying 4,000 machines in a week, not so hot maybe necessarily uh, if you're trying to deploy 4,000 machines over the course of maybe this year. And so for something like that, we might go for more of a thin provisioning model. right? Same packages, still up in your management server. But you could create policies that say, if you don't see CyberDog, for those of you who've been around long enough, if you don't see various applications present on this box, please put them there. Um, it's really no different than what you're going to eventually do anyway. Eventually, you're going to say, well, if you have an old version of Office, put the patch on there for me. Well, what's the difference between doing that for a machine that's already been somewhat configured and doing that to configure a machine that's never been configured? So lots of options here. I think really the main takeaway should be the more you put in, the more you'll get out, like any management system. One of the things that we did um, for this customer site, at this customer site, was also built specific scripts that, were, um, that just helped our processes go a lot faster. So for example, the script actually would set the asset tag, or take that asset tag number and name the device. One of the challenges that the customer was trying to, or one of the problems that they were trying to solve was, how do we figure out who has what computer? So initially, we were going with a pretty complex naming scheme. But then as they saw how the asset tag number could actually be tied back to the serial number, and they were able to pinpoint the owner of that machine or the end user for that machine, we changed the, the workflow and changed, changed the methodology that we were using so that it was just that asset tag number that gave them the information. So as you're going through your processes, Sometimes we get in a situation, I know this would never happen to me, no. where I just get stuck doing the same thing over and over again, and I forget to look outside of that saying, is there some way I could do this better? So when you're doing your deployments, you may have done 10 already, but look at different ways that you can streamline your process or better your process, even doing something simple, as, well, simple as simple. a script. <laughs> and I think you're going to find, too, is that, um, you know, as Priya said, well, if you've already done 10. Well, if you've already done 10, you've probably figured out some of the things that you liked and disliked. And certainly, we're not advocating that right in the middle of the first 10 of your 4,000, you switch the process completely. But you know, have a notebook stand, you know, right by so that you can mark this stuff down. Because six months from now, when you get to you know, play the game all over again, wouldn't it be nice to say, oh, yeah, that's the thing that I want to plan for this time? Um, again, so many things you can't control, control the things that you can. Um, 
as you go through, I think, again, this is sort of me. I, I jumped ahead a little bit. I get excited about policies and thin provisioning. But it just gives you an idea sort of how we organize a lot of our policies up internally. Now, for those of you that are running on Casper 8, maybe this is an incentive. Um, but just that ability to organize those policies in a little bit more of a flexible way. Um, each one of those little plus symbols on the left-hand side probably has about 20 actual policies each. Uh, to them, so some of them self-service oriented, some of them just in the background, some of them related to original provisioning of devices. So if you haven't done imaging. Go for it. Uh, <laughs> sure, I'll jump in, sorry. Uh, if you haven't done imaging, uh, then this just gives you an idea of what that process would look like. If you're doing sort of traditional uh, uh, flat in the box and go ahead and put things back on the device. Just basically our interface, and if you take a peek, just on that left-hand side, you're seeing all the same things that we had in our base student image configuration. But uh, really and truly, the idea here is that we should be as flexible as your needs are. So if you take a look up top, there is that custom uh, button that we've got up there. If you were to hit that custom button, you could add or remove anything that you wanted uh, as you went through. So you don't have to necessarily be stuck with one config. Again, if you do go through maybe 10 machines and realize, wait a second, we forgot Chrome, you could go in and maybe add that while someone's simultaneously making the change to the configuration. So this was the, um, the structure that we had at, at this customer site. The first row of machines, that top row of machines, were the master uh, imaging devices. And then the ones below are the client machines. We use target mode imaging. On average, it took about 12 minutes per machine. And that was including not only laying down the image, but also doing all the network, so all the AD binding, um, any policies that were being run. Start to finish, about 12 minutes per machine. That's pretty significant from a time-saving standpoint. Yeah, and we had, uh, you sort of remember, it was sort of the long rectangular room. We basically had um, five machines on either side, so 10 total, and then five machines at the far end. So the advantage of this was that, you know, whether it was Doug or Priya or myself, or Brad, any of us there, we could babysit five machines at a whack. So rather than necessarily needing to uh, you know, work through one machine at a time or something like that, as long as you were starting all five at once, you could anticipate that they would more than likely finish about the same time, take them, walk them over, plug them into our switch, let them check into the JSS. And we didn't box until we knew that they had checked in, gotten their APN set up, and uh, bound to AD, which is the reason for that script. Um, so there are lots of options that you have just to sort of guarantee the outcome. That script just happened to be the one that we used. But you might just use maybe a login uh, change with a login banner or something like that. And one of the things that we did um, as part of this process was we had a larger team on site with us. And we had a couple of folks helping us with the testing. So we would go ahead and do the imaging portion of it. One out of every 10 machines or so, we would give it to the QA person so that they, they would go through and verify that things were working. And we actually were able to nail down some problems that we were having, get them fixed pretty quickly, and then continue with the process. So it's having an iterative process and a flexible process as you're going through it will save you a lot of headaches down the road. I think it's pretty unavoidable that uh, you know, someone maybe within your organization or department that maybe you have to work with, they're going to come to you once, once you've already started. And they're going to let you know, hey, by the way, this one thing has to change. And you're looking at the 500 machines you've just done. Um, and that's going to happen. It's just the way of it, you know? Folks, uh, folks have differing deadlines and so on. And so one of the things that um, I think that's so great about a lot of this is that we all get maybe stuck in, uh, I certainly did, about this idea of monolithic imaging. And if it wasn't in, it's not going to happen until next semester, period. Well, there's nothing really stopping you if you wanted to. And you can ensure the right amount of QA. And you know that there won't be any sort of negative uh, effect to changing on machine 501 and forward that, and we'll also add this. And then just creating the policy to address the other 500 once they're out in the environment. But that's like Priya said, just one of those places where if you've always done it a certain way, that may not be obvious right up front. And, and I know I definitely struggled early on with this idea of, gee, I have all these tools available that I never had before. But those old habits, they die hard. Um, so trying to keep current with what the tool is giving you the ability to do will definitely be beneficial. And to add to what Matt was just saying, I, I mean, really, the end goal is this, right? We want to get the devices to our end users. That's why we're going through this whole thing from planning to implementation to imaging and deploying. The end, the end goal is getting it to the end user. But that's not the end of the process. For us, 
one of the things we want to talk about is sustainability. What does this look like in your environment? Because once you get it to your end user, that's not where your responsibility stops, right? It's not a, well, you know what, good luck. I'm walking away. <laughs> See you in a year. Yeah. It really is about what do you do with new applications when they come into your environment? Your, your boss comes to you and says, hey, we need to get this application out to everybody. What are you going to do with it? There are software updates that come. And then you pull out the user agreement. Yep. And you say, I've got five days. Yeah. So one of the things that we do at, at Jamf, um, the way that we use the software is actually to use a self-service portal. Do, how many folks are using self-service? Should I skip the next four slides? Yes. <laughs> we'll just go right through those. I mean, th this is really what we do. So we're all admins on our machines to talk a little bit about what we do. We're all admins on our machines. But we use policies to scope who has, ex who has access to what software, for example. In the role that I have, I don't really need Adobe Creative Suite. Our marketing team does. So IT has a policy scope such that if I need it, I can ask for it. But I see what's available to me. So this is a great way of distributing the content to your end users without um, having to go through a, a headache of a process. But I'm really preaching to the choir, as, as I saw with the, the show of hands. One of the things for our customer um, that we've been talking about is they didn't realize that they could push out um, the, the printer files. This was huge for them. They, they didn't have a really good way of doing this before for their end users. This saved a lot of headache for them because they were able to, to really um, put policies around who could get access to what computers, or sorry, what printers, in what area, in what schools. I mean, it was really helping them to define um, the availability of these devices without having to go through a lot of manual touching. The last thing is license management. I'll turn it, over, turn it back sure, to Matt. Sure. So, you know, uh, uh, software audits aren't fun. I'll just leave it at that. Um, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good night, folks. Uh, software audits aren't fun. And the most nerve-wracking part of any kind of an audit from any sort of a vendor is really just about, do you really know what's out there? And do you actually know how many people are using it? So taking the, the scary, fearful part of that aside for a second, um, the nice thing about knowing what's out there and knowing who's using it is that you don't spend a lot of budget on things that no one's actually using for their day-to-day -day job. And so one of the things that um, we find uh, very often folks aren't making use of is that ability to say, we are licensed for, say, six seats of Microsoft Office for the Mac. And that consists of a handful of applications. And if you see any of those apps launch, I'd like you to not only track that the app was installed, but if it ever got used. And so you can start to get away. I know I made fun of that big black file cabinet, but you know the top drawer is where all the media is. The second drawer is where all those email confirmations of you have 20 licenses, your license key is, next semester you bought 20 more, and so now there's like a stack this big. And So putting aside the idea that volume licenses are very nice and save you lots of time, once you do have the licenses you need, it's really a great idea to track them. Because now, again, you get fr from away from that fixing it when it's broken side of IT to the service side. And you can go to folks and say, gee, your department bought $10,000 worth of this app. Four people have launched it. Um, do you want to maybe spend the money on other things next year? Or should we continue on? Uh, so it's just a nice way to try and turn some of your IT intelligence into business intelligence for the rest of the organization. We can store things like your serial numbers, um, who it was licensed to. Again, trying. Did I hear a laugh for the sneakers yes, you reference? Did. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you know, again, getting away from that large file cabinet. And if you just go to that last one, we can just sure. take a peek. Really, all this is is just a matter of saying if you see something that looks like a piece of software whose version number is like. So very straightforward stuff. If you use smart groups, you absolutely know how to use this. And it'd be really nice to have this in place before you find yourself on the other end of an audit. Part of sustainability for us is training your, your end users, but also your IT staff. It's not just about, we got the devices out, great, we know how to put the software updates out. It's making sure that the folks who are responsible for, for sustaining the environment are actually trained up, and you guys have the resources that you need. But it's also teaching our end users um, about the acceptable use policy in K-12 environments, teaching the students about um, secure surfing, right? What, 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 are, what is privacy in these days? 
and it's really educating the end user about how they're using their devices in, this, in the interweb world. We talked about a lot of things today. Um, these are the four major categories that we talked about. We're here all week. I know it was, there was a lot of information that was shared and a lot of information that wasn't shared. We're here to have that conversation with you because really we believe that it's not only the IT portion of it, right? It's so much bigger than that. It's about planning and then all the way through sustainability. What are some of the resources that we have available for you? Jam Software employees, we're all here. We've got the magenta. Is magenta. it magenta? It's magenta. Um, it's not lanyards. Pink. <laughs> You've got each other, the Jam Fuser community. Our website, and then also Apple's website. There's a lot of great content out there. So we encourage you to go take a look. Um, if, if you have any questions or anything like that, Matt and I are here throughout um, the entire conference, and uh, we're happy to, to assist in any way that we can. So with the remaining time that we have, which is about seven minutes, are there any questions, questions, comments? And just to head off a couple of things, if you do have specific questions about your environment, I'm doing nothing after this session, so I'd love to sit and talk with anybody. I'm wondering if there is or going to be a multicast solution with NetBoot for imaging? So there is nothing that I am aware of currently. That's not to say that there wouldn't be eventually. I would definitely say feature request if there's not already one, and I believe there is one. That's right, from the resource kit back when. And from what I understand, that still functions, but there's no turnkey solution. There's no push button solution. Um, is that something that you guys would definitely benefit from in your environment? Well, we've used it on PC side with great yeah. success, and I think that that has led us to think that possibly on the Mac side, too. Sure. Awesome. I'd love to get your information afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Questions? Sorry? Please. <laughs> I was just curious how big the image was that took 12 minutes. Sure, sure. Uh, 30, Brad, 30 gigs, 32 gigs? Yeah, it was, it was in the ballpark, though, like high 20s, low 30s. Yeah, and mainly because of uh, Thunderbolt. So Thunderbolt with air to air. Yep. Although if you were to do it with NetBoot, <laughs> if you've got a gigabit network, it's not going to be tremendously slower than that. I mean, I've done side by side, where if it's just a sort of a base image, um, if you're, the, the big difference for us was that we were SSD to SSD. So if we were spinning disk to spinning disk, I've had folks do a bake-off, and if they're not saturating the network with NetBoot, NetBoot is like this much slower, but it's not a heck of a lot slower. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Anybody? Any other questions? Anybody or? Yes. Oh. oh. In, in the kitchen, yeah. Uh, so the question was, um, is there anything out there that we are aware of or that we're working on at Jamf uh, to speed up iPad configuration? And again, I, I, would, I would pull from Apple and say that we don't talk about unannounced products. But that said, there's nothing that I'm aware of um, that we're doing necessarily. I mean, I think as you heard uh, pretty strongly this morning, we usually like to embrace and endorse Apple technologies. So if they're working on something that'll speed it up, you can be darn sure that we'll embrace it. Please. So uh, again, the follow-up question there was just um, that uh, there was a limit to how many machines they could successfully, how many iPads they could successfully enroll. That's not something I've experienced personally, but I'd be curious to get more of your specifics to find out maybe how many devices, what the JSS was uh, scoped for at the time, you know, if, they, if it was scaled up, able to handle the concurrent connections. Yep. Absolutely, as well. Uh, one of the comments in the front was just what the hardware was that you were using as your configurator station, as well. I'll just confirm. I've seen that, too. I have a managed service provider. We do a lot of different tools. That is a configurator thing. 
more than it is in tasks. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to get some of your specifics. Um, maybe afterwards we could talk. Yeah. Anyone else? Anybody? All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending. We hope this was useful for you. Um, like we said, we're here. So. Search us out. Yeah. Thank you.